Cool. Sounds like I'm on. Good morning. It is great to be with you guys worshiping this morning. Yes, this is my wife's iPad. That's why it's pink. But uh, yeah, I'm just excited. I'm excited to get to share the word with you guys uh, this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and say a prayer. I'm going to dive right into it. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for how great you are, how loving you are, how merciful you are. I pray that, uh, yeah, that this morning that your spirit just speaks through me, Father, that I can let go of anything, you know, that may be distracting my thoughts, and that I can really just focus on you, Father, that each of us in this room can just focus on on your word, on your message, on your scripture, Father, and I pray that you just speak powerfully through me this morning, and we can just all leave feeling closer to you and inspired. Uh, thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So this is our final week uh, focusing on the Beatitudes. If you're new with us this morning, um, and this month we've been focusing on the idea of being pure in heart. Um, and, and we started out talking a lot about our motives. Like, what is your motive? And I want to bring us back to that question. What is your motive? As we wrap this up and You know, for me, it can be really difficult to to figure that answer out. What is my motive? You know, it takes time of me going and and really praying, prayer journaling, um, you know, and keep asking myself why. Why do I do the things that I do? You know, why do I want to honor God? Why do I want to read my Bible? Why do I want to pray? Why do I want to share my faith? Uh, Just in all these things, asking what the motive is. and, and, And something I've realized is... My motive, you know, my heart being pure, is, it's very tied to where my relationship with God is at at the time. The, the more that I'm, you know, investing in my relationship, the more I long to read and long to pray and spend time with the Father, I find my heart being a lot more pure. I find my heart being a lot more filled with Him, but the times where I get distracted, the times where I start to become content with where I'm at, you know, it can be so easy to fall back, you know, and make my heart about myself. Make it about how can I be comfortable? How can I look good? And, you know, but the question is, how can we sustain a pure heart? You know, how can we make sure that our motives don't become impure? And, you know, for me, it's just, it really does come to my relationship with God. How connected do I feel with the Father? And in the times where I find myself going through the motions, it's so hard to have that pure heart. And, you know, when I, when I hear the word pure, pure in heart, um, I know it's only July, but I can't help but think of Christmas. Yeah. And my parents are probably laughing because they know I love Christmas, but, but growing up, I always felt like there's just something so magical yeah. about Christmas and getting to wake up knowing that Santa had come, getting to run down the stairs and just see all the presents underneath the lit Christmas tree. And there's just this raw joy and curiosity that fills the air for Christmas on Christmas morning. And even though I'm 23 and I'm married, I, I still have that same feeling of joy. And I'm just excited. And it's not as much about the presents anymore. Definitely was when I was younger, but I just want the day to start. I just long for Christmas morning and I never sleep well. I always wake up super early without an alarm clock. And because of that, my parents had to set a rule. I'm not allowed to wake them up until 6 a.m. That was hard. I was up at like 4.30 most of the time. So I just have to sit in my room, watching the clock, waiting. You know, and it's funny because at 6 a.m. this last Christmas, I was still standing above my parents' bed. They woke up, and I'm standing there, ready to wake them up, ready to go wake the rest of the house up. You know, Sammy wasn't ready for that. You know, she, she had heard us talk the night before that, hey, what time can I wake you guys up tomorrow? Is it still 6? Has it changed now that I'm married? I don't know if she thought I was kidding, but uh, yeah, she now knows how much I actually love Christmas, how much joy it brings me in. It's funny because someone asked me the day before my wedding, how are you feeling? And I was like, feels like Christmas Eve. Like that was the best way <laughs> to describe it. There's this joy and this excitement. And I'm sure you guys all know that feeling. Yeah, you know, that I'm describing, the feeling that I have on Christmas morning. There's an excitement. There's a longing. You know, and, and that's what a pure heart looks like. You know, does that describe, that, does that feeling describe your, how you feel towards God? You know, for me, there are times where that is true, but most of the time, that's not. Most of the time, it, you know, I don't have that just longing, you know, where I wake up and I'm like, yes, I get to spend time with God this morning. 
But imagine how, li- how different our lives would be if that is how we woke up. If that is how we woke up every morning just knowing, man, I get to spend time with my father. I get to spend time and I get to learn more about who he is. You know, because God is such an amazing God. He is powerful. He is loving. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's our creator. He gave everything for us. He sent his son to die for us. So why wouldn't we have that joy? Why wouldn't we feel like, man, like we just received the best gift? Because every day that that's true. Every day Jesus, you know, he still died for us. That doesn't change. So the the sole motive as someone who's pure in heart is that they have a longing to know God and to see him move. And so the title of my lesson this morning is The Pure in Heart, A Longing for the Lord. So you guys can go ahead and turn over to Mark chapter 12. Uh, We'll pick up in verse 28 in a minute here. Uh, You know, God made us with a longing and a desire to know him and to serve him. You know, that's why the things of this world cannot fulfill us. It's, It's written in our DNA to have this deep longing for God, to want to know him, to want to know his heart. And, you know, but Satan does everything he can to draw us away from that. Satan does everything he can to make us lose sight of our father. That's why the world is designed to distract us, to give us this false sense of comfort and security. Because our enemy wants to take us out. He wants us to take our focus off of God and what he's done for us. Because he knows that if we lose sight of that, then we won't be a threat to him. But we need to live a life that's that's striving to live for God. I'm going to go ahead and read Mark chapter 12. Starting in verse 28. So this is the greatest commandment. It says, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. You know, Jesus says that the greatest commandment has nothing to do with following the laws and the regulations. He doesn't say it's making sure to give your weekly tithe. He doesn't say it's to make sure you don't commit some certain sin. It's not even showing up to church on Sunday morning. The greatest commandment is to give God everything. To love him with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with our Father. And, and to summarize that, it's, it's having a longing to know God. You know, and that's what my first point is this morning. It's a longing to know God. The pure in heart have a longing to know God. And they're blessed because they will see him. You know, people with a pure heart will see God. Because they long to see him. They long to know him more. Like, if you don't know someone, how are you expected to see them? And, you know, do you have a longing to know our Father? It may seem like a pretty simple question, right? We're we're at church, right? You're here to hear a lesson about God, to sing some songs about God, to take communion, right, and remember his sacrifice. It's, It's a simple question. But do you really have a longing for him, a deep seated desire? to grow in your understanding of who he is, to grow in your love for him? Does everything you do revolve around him and growing in that knowledge, growing in that love because of who who he is? The word pure means not mixed or adulterated with any other material. You know, it means to be free of contamination. And so to be pure in heart is to have God be your everything, that there's nothing else mixed in. And we can't love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul and our strength if we're allowing other things to contaminate us. You know, but if we do, if God is our everything, then there won't be room 
for things to creep in because God will fulfill you. God will fill you up. And there's nothing that you could add in that can make your life better than God. There's nothing that you can substitute. Right. You know, God is love. God will fulfill you. He is enough. But you have to give him your heart. You have to give him everything that you have. You know, so what ways have you allowed yourself to be contaminated with this morning? What is the impurity that you've allowed into your heart? You know, maybe it's a sin that you're struggling to repent of. Maybe it's some relationship that you just have such a desire for. Maybe it's your pride or an insecurity. But regardless of what it is, you know, it probably comes from a lack of knowledge or belief in something about God, something about his promises. There's something that you're just not understanding because God is love. God is perfect. He does love you. You know, so when we just have these misbeliefs, when we are told these lies, it comes from something that we're just not understanding about our Father. And, and for me, you know, the biggest impurity in my heart is just the desire to be seen as good enough. Like, I want people to look at me and just be like, wow, like he, he is good. He is valued. You know, that even that, man, like, I can see God through him. Right? And those things aren't, like, bad, right? It can be so easy for me to look at that and be like, well, I just want people to see God. I want people to look at me and see God, but my motive behind that isn't necessarily God. It's I want people to view me as good enough, to see me as enough. And, you know, a, a good example of this is when I first got into the campus ministry. I, I felt like I should be leading a Bible talk. I was a, had been a disciple longer than some of the guys leading, and I felt like I knew my Bible a lot better, to be honest, just because I had grown up reading it more. And I th thought because of those things, I should be the one leading. That people could look at me and be like, man, look at that freshman. Like, he's leading a Bible talk on campus. He's, he's so spiritual, you know, and, like, that's, that's cool, right? It's good to be able to lead a Bible talk, but my heart wasn't to share the word with people. You know, as I wanted people to view me good, and that's why I wanted to lead a Bible talk. Not, I want to lead a Bible talk so I can help reach the lost. You know, it's because I, it's just, I have this struggle of really believing that I can be enough for God, that I am enough, that he does love me. You know, because I look at myself, and I'm like, I fall short. I sin. We all do. So why would God love me? Why would God send his son to die for me? I don't think I'm worthy of that. And so I feel like I need to draw, draw that worthiness from others. I need other people to affirm that, that lie. And, and even though I struggle with this, that God sees me enough, conceptually I do know that he does. I think a lot of us, if you've, go, if you've been going to church for a while, you know that the lie you believe is not true, but you don't believe it in your heart, right? And that's where I'm at. And, but it's cool because even though I see that, even though I recognize that, it makes me want to know God more. It makes me want to understand, God, why do you love me? Why would you choose to allow me to enter your kingdom? Why would you choose to send your son to die for me? You know, I want to grow in my understanding of who he is. You know, so what's the thing that keeps your heart from being pure? You know, why does that keep you from giving it all to God? And how is it related to some lie that Satan tells you, some misconception about who God is? Because we need to be able to identify those things so that we can turn back to God, turn back towards his goodness. And, and God doesn't want us just to know of him, guys. He wants us to know him. He wants us to know his heart. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And that's why the greatest commandment, it isn't following some rule. It's to love the Lord your God with everything you have, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It's giving him everything. It's longing to know who he is. It's longing to grow in your love for God. And, you know, we need to love him regardless of how we may feel. Whatever those lies are, you know, whatever you contend to believe, no matter how tired you may feel physically, Right, because life does throw a lot at us at times. You know, but that but God doesn't change. His character does not change. And, and we need to seek after that right. every day of our lives. And you know, if we do, that will just allow us to scratch the surface of how good God is, how great He is. Because He's so much bigger than we could ever imagine. He's so much greater. He loves us so much more. So why wouldn't we try and understand?
why wouldn't we strive to know his heart? You know, something I've learned is that the stronger I desire, to, the, the more I know about who God is, the more I desire to learn more. The more that I feel like I'm loving him, the more I want to love him, which, which is interesting, right? Because I'm like, man, I, I have this little nugget that I have, and it's like I want another one. I want more. I desire more. And Man, it's so much easier to be fired up for God when I'm seeking after him, when I'm longing to know his heart. You know, the pure in heart desire a deep connection with the Father. You know, they desire to believe in his promises, and they want to see God move. And, and guys, if we don't know God, it's extremely difficult to see him move because we're looking in all the wrong places. You know, I think of 1 Kings chapter 19. You don't have to turn there, uh, but this is the story of Elijah in the cave. You know, he has this encounter with God, and you know, Elijah goes up to this cave, and he sees a powerful wind that's tearing through the mountains. He sees a giant earthquake and fire, but yet he sees God in a gentle whisper. And I could imagine how easy it would have been to miss that. Like, if he didn't know God, Man, like there's his powerful wind. That must be God. That's God's power. But no, God was in the gentle whisper. And Elijah recognized that he, because he knew who God was. He had given him his everything. And, and something that's cool about this story is, is the location of where it takes place. So it says Elijah traveled 40 days to go to Mount Horeb, which if you don't know, is called the mountain of God. And this is the same mountain where God appears to Moses and the burning bush, and gives him the command to go and free the Israelites from Egypt. It's a place where people encounter God. You know, and I don't necessarily know if Elijah purposely wandered there, but the odds of him wandering around the desert for 40 days and randomly ending up at that position is very unlikely. You know, he, he probably knew, man, that's, that's where God's going to be, and I'm going to go there. I'm going to go 40 days out of my way to the mountain of God. Either that, or he was at least following God enough. He was seeking after him to be led by the Spirit there. But either way, we see that there's this longing. Like right before this, he's like, God, just kill me now because I'm tired. I'm worn. I've given everything. You know, and, and God gives him a little bit. God gives him strength. And we see him go 40 days to encounter God, to commune with God. There's this longing to be with him, to hear him, and to see him. You know, so where are you at today? Are you longing for the Lord like Elijah? Are you going out of your way to put yourself in a position to hear him, to put yourself in a position to speak with him? Because Elijah traveled 40 days. That's a lot. Like, that's not a, that's not a small trek. No. That's far. But he just wanted to draw near to God. And, and we might never fully understand God and everything about him, but part of following him and loving him is trusting him. You know, and even when we don't understand God's reasoning, do you trust him with everything in your life? You know, because when we're fully surrendered and we're longing to see him, that's when we will. That's when we'll see God. And, you know, if you look at the context of this story, that's where Elijah was at. You know, he had given everything, all his heart, all his mind, all his soul, all his strength. And it's pretty evident. All right, right before this, he stands up before the king and queen of Israel, Ahab and Jezebel, and he confronts their false prophets of Baal and challenges them to show them who the true God is, right? And we know if you read the story that, you know, obviously God wins out, right? And you'd think that, yes, he stood up, and he showed Israel who God was, but immediately after that, Jezebel sends someone to try and kill him. He says, if you're not dead by this time tomorrow, then... Like, that, that was her mindset. She was going to kill him. And that's why he fled. That's why he said, I want to die. That's what led him to this place, was that he gave everything he had. There was nothing left that he could give in that moment because he just wanted to see God. He wanted to know God. He wanted to commune with God. You know, the greatest commandment in the Bible is to love and to seek after God with everything that we have. And when we do, we will see him move. We will hear his voice. You know, and, and that will lead us to just understanding a fraction of how great he is. 
You know, and when we, when we see God move in our lives, when we long to know him, then we'll have a longing for others to know him as well. You know, the second greatest commandment, Jesus says, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And when we have a longing to know God and to see him move, we'll naturally long for others. You know, just rereading in Mark, you know, it says, this is the most important commandment, and to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. People with a pure heart, you know, they have a longing to see God. They have a longing to know God. But they also can't help but long for others to know him. That's my second point. You know, people with a pure heart long for others to know God. You know, so do you have that longing? Do you long for other people to know the Father? And if not, you need to ask yourself why. Because if we have, like, just a minimal understanding of how good, how great God is, why wouldn't you want to share that? Why wouldn't you want other people to experience that? If you believe God sent his son to die for you, that he washes away your sins, that he wants to spend an eternity with you, why wouldn't you share the gospel? Why wouldn't you share Jesus, the good news, with them? And Jesus says to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second greatest commandment after loving God. And there's nothing that you can do more to love a person than to share Jesus with them. There's nothing that you can do that's greater than that. You know, maybe you're really good at baking, right? And you can, you can make some really good cookies, and you give them to your neighbor. You know, sure, they'll enjoy it, right? They might feel a little loved, but that's not going to change their eternity. That's not going to change their relationship with God. But Jesus will. Sharing the gospel with people will. They'll get to know the Father. You know, in, in Matthew 28, you know, so I have to turn there. This is the Great Commission. Right? We, we know this passage. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. At the Great Commission, Jesus tells his disciples to go and spread the gospel, to go and spread the good news about who Jesus is. And, and his disciples had seen Jesus. They had walked with him. They knew him, right? And so when Jesus says to go out, to go love, to go share the gospel, you know, there wasn't a second thought about it. If you read through the book of Acts, there's this boldness that these disciples had where they stand be, before large crowds, they go and they stand before kings and governors, you know, and they preach a message that could get them killed. And some of them did. Some of them died because of what they said. But there's this boldness that they had and that came from just knowing who Jesus was, that they wanted other people to experience what they had experienced, to see lives change the ways that their lives had been. And, and I get it. Sharing your faith, it's not always fun. It can be intimidating. It can be uncomfortable. It puts you in a position where, where you can be judged, where you can be persecuted. It's just how it is. You know, if it's with your family or your friends or your coworkers, they might not view you the same after that. You know, they might, they might judge you. Your relationship might be different, and those are people that you have to see. But what if those things stopped the first century disciples? You know, what if they had just backed down because they didn't want to be judged? They didn't want to be persecuted. They didn't want to be uncomfortable. None of us would be here today. You know, but if we call ourselves disciples, the call is the same. The call is to love others. The call is to share the gospel with them. And it's not out of an obligation, but it's because we've seen who God is. It's because we've walked with Jesus and we know him. And we long to know him more. You know, who God is should be enough for us to not only be willing to preach the gospel, but we should long for it. We should long for people to see God. Yeah. We should have a burning desire for that. 
Because that's the best way that you can love those around you. So there's nothing that you could do more. Because God is love. It says it in 1 John a couple times. God is love. And so to withhold him from people, like how can you love that person? If you are withholding the source of love from them, you cannot love them. We have to be willing to share the gospel with them. You know, so do you have a longing to share Jesus with people in your life? And if not, do you even have a willingness to? You know, we should, we should long to share Jesus. But like I said earlier, sometimes life is just hard. Sometimes we don't feel like it because we're just, we just feel down. We feel tired. We feel worn out. You know, but if you're not even willing to do that, then you need to reevaluate, man, do you really feel loved by God? Do you really love him back? Because, man, we should want to share that with them. Like, if you really long for God, if you really see him, if you love him, you'll want other people to see that. And being a disciple, it means denying ourselves. It means carrying our cross. It means following Jesus because he is our Lord and our Savior. You know, and honestly, this aspect of pure in heart, it can be challenging for me. Like, I know I should share my faith with people, but it's so much easier to do it out of an obligation because I know that this is the right thing to do, to do it out of obedience rather than just a longing to see other people know God. And I'm not saying that God, you know, completely disregards those times when we're not feeling it. In fact, you know, 1 John 5, 3 says, this is love for God, to keep his commands. You know, even when we're not feeling it, it's still a command. But the second part is, but his commands are not burdensome. You know, we should get to a point where we just love God, and that's not a burden. It should not be a burden to share our faith with Christ. We should long to do it because of what we've experienced. You know, sharing Jesus with people, it needs to be so much more than just an obligation. You know, we need to long for that. We should long for people to know who God is because God is love. And to withhold him is the opposite of loving that person. And a couple I feel really exemplifies this is the Mitchells. Uh, if you don't know them, they are an awesome couple. They moved here probably about a year ago. Um, and they're in our family, in our family group. And so what that is is uh, once a month we meet in smaller groups and we just have a meal together. We pray together and we share good news. And it seems like every single time we meet up, they're sharing about some new couple that they just randomly met. Right? Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe someone they just met on a walk. You know, and just how they shared the gospel with them. And they're like, hey, pray for this person. Pray that they decide to come out. Pray that they study the Bible. You know, and, and that's the heart of someone that just longs for people to know God. You know, and they don't do it out of an obligation. No one told them that they had to bring a friend out. No one told them that they had to, you know, share their faith with a certain amount of people. They just do it because they love God and they want other people to experience that same thing. And in the book of Acts, we see 3,000 people baptized in one day. That didn't just happen. You know, it happened because the disciples stood up and they preached Jesus. They preached what Jesus had done to that group. And, man, like imagine if each of us had that same heart that the Mitchells had, that the disciples had, that just longed to share the gospel with other people. Just think about where this church could be. Think about where the kingdom of God could be. Like, we'd be a group that's so fired up for who God is, and we'd be seeing him move in so many powerful ways. So many people turning their lives to him, you know, just because we opened our mouths and gave them a chance to know who Jesus is. The disciples knew who Jesus was, and as a result, they were willing to give up everything to share him with the world. They longed for people to experience the same freedom and salvation that comes with following Christ. Now, how much have you been willing to give up for people to know who Jesus is? How much have you? Are you willing? Do you long for people to know the Father? You know, to be pure in heart, it comes from a longing to know God. You know, seeking after him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And just longing to see him to see him move in your life, to understand his heart. You know, it's having that Christmas morning mindset towards our relationship with God, with the Father. You know, to where we long to just be in his presence and understand him. You know, and if we long to see him, if we long to know him, 
we naturally long for other people to as well. Because we'll just be so grateful for what we've been given. But is that real? Do you long for God? Do you long for others to know him? And, and when you long for others to know him, honestly, that's one of the easiest ways to see God move. Because if you introduce someone to God, they will be transformed. Like, God will change them. You will see him moving in powerful ways. You'll see repentance. You'll see them turning their lives to him. You know, so where are you at? Do you long to grow closer to God? Or are you content with where you're at? I have two challenges for you guys this morning. And the first one is just to find a way to rekindle the love and passion that you had at first. I think of Revelations 2, 2 through 5. It says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. And, and that's awesome, right? We see that, man, they persevered. But Jesus says that they've endured. But the second part is, you know, Jesus continues to say, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If we don't have a love for God, if we're not actively pursuing after our relationship with him, then eventually we'll forget who he is. We'll forget why we chose to follow him, and we'll just be doing things out of obedience. You know, for me, what this looks like is every once in a while, I just need to go off in the woods, find a high rock, and just have my Bible in the notebook. And just spend time reading and praying and journaling, just trying to reconnect with God's heart. You know, so what do you need to do to return to the love that you had at first? You know, remember who God is and rekindle your passion for him. And the second challenge is, you know, to just think through the last month and how, your, how has your evangelism been? Do you have a burning desire to share the word of God with people? You know, Jeremiah 29 says, But if I say I will not mention his word, or speak any more in his name. His word is like a fire. His word in my heart is like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. You know, when we know who God is, when we see him, that's our heart. Like We can't help but share him with others. We can't help but long for other people to know him. And I know life isn't perfect, but the truth is, and if your life isn't filled with evangelism, then you're probably missing something about who God is, right? There's that lack of understanding of his love. And that's why the first thing is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because if we don't have that, we're not going to have a longing for other people to know. We're not going to have the heart that the first century disciples had. You know, the pure in heart have a longing to know God. And they have a longing for others to know him. And it's simply because they've seen the blessings that God has given them. They've seen how God has moved in their own life. And they've seen him do amazing things in the lives of those around them. Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God. Thank you. Great job, Jacob. Um, as he was preaching, um, I just started thinking about how it applies to my life. And uh, one thing that really hit me is why I have a hard time desiring God and also just desiring other people to know God. I think it's just because I'm too worried about my life. You know, I worry about a lot, about a lot, a lot of things. And even right now, my biggest worry is about my son. You know, most, most of you know that we had a, you know, a son about 14 months ago. But, you know, we're not young parents. We're actually older parents. Uh, I won't tell you how old. You guys can guess that one by the white hair, you know, up here. But, um, you know, one thing that I constantly worry about is, am I going to be here to watch him grow up? You know, because I've had a lot of, you know, quite a few friends pass away in the last couple of years. 
a lot of them are, you know, not that much older than I am. Some of them are younger. You know, so, so those are the things I worry about. And when I worry about myself so much, it's hard for me to see God. And it's hard for me to see, to want, you know, to even see other people in their desire for God. So I'm like, I just need to start worrying, you know, I just trust God, you know, so amen. All right, let's go to God in prayer, and uh, we'll have one last song. Uh, Dearly Father, just like to thank you so much for the lesson, just what I need, you know, to, to, to really take a stock of where I am and just to, to start worrying about my life. And, and I know we all have things that prevent us from desiring you, but I pray that we would just help us to, to shake that off and just help us to desire you and really help others to get to know you as well. We love you, Father. Jesus, we pray. Amen.